tonight on Evening Edition. A local man is charged with stealing millions of dollars in a Ponzi scheme. While the farm was real, nothing else was. It didn't actually generate any profits for investors. A full report on the charges and his day in court. And retiring in San Diego isn't as easy as it once was. But some seniors are still able to afford the good life. We'll show you how. And a pop-up art gallery is coming to City Heights. When and where you can find Little Saigon Stories. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Friday, April 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A Poway man is accused of stealing millions of dollars. The San Diego District Attorney's Office says it's a classic Ponzi scheme. And KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says many of the victims are seniors. 46-year-old Christopher Doherty was arraigned in court today, accused of scamming investors out of nearly $8 million. Doherty shuffled money around in the classic Ponzi scheme style, paying fake profits to ones who complained and then using funds from new investors to pay off the complaining victims. Doherty allegedly told people they were investing in an organic cattle ranch in Alpine. While the farm was real, nothing else was. It didn't actually generate any profits for investors. San Diego County District Attorney Summer Steffen says eventually the alleged scheme fell apart. Once investors began to demand their money and Doherty couldn't pay it back and all of his excuses began to run, run out, the Ponzi scheme collapsed, leaving the victims with nothing. The investigation into Doherty was started by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, who says one couple in their mid-70s lost nearly everything. The couple's investments total over $1.2 million and consist of their entire retirement savings. In 2018, the dividend payments stopped and the couple had to borrow money and leverage their home just to meet their day-to-day -day expenses. If they're unable to recoup any of their money from Doherty, they will most likely have to sell their home and at their age, what should have been their golden years of retirement will become a living nightmare. DA Summer Steffen says Doherty has filed for bankruptcy, but her office will try and get people their money back. We have filed a special allegation to freeze all of the assets that he has, his bank accounts, his properties, his home, uh, in an attempt to give victims restitution. That we're focused on that because we know at the end of the day, uh, justice has to involve the victims being able to pay their bills. Doherty is charged with scamming 31 families, but the DA's office says there are a number of additional victims. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Doherty faces up to 35 years in prison if convicted of all charges. Today, he pleaded not guilty and remains in jail. A recent nationwide outbreak of measles has San Diego County on high alert. Local health officials are urging residents to vaccinate their children. So far this year, the CDC has confirmed nearly 700 measles cases across 22 states. The outbreak has not reached our county yet, but Los Angeles has quarantined around 300 people believed to be have been exposed to the disease. Health officials say the outbreak is partially caused by parents who are choosing to bypass vaccinations. The CDC CDC recommends children receive all their vaccinations, including measles, chickenpox, whooping cough, and polio. Zandag unveils its new plan for the future of transportation here in San Diego. As KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen explains, it prompted some passionate debate. Sandag Executive Director Hassan Ikrada has been ruffling feathers since he started his job last December. His vision for the county, traveling by public transit, should be just as fast, if not faster, than driving. He says his biggest concern is creating a transportation plan that complies with state law. That means reducing car travel and greenhouse gas emissions. I think what people need to step, you know, to get away from is stop saying transit versus highway. We're looking at this as a system. These five big moves apply to the highway as much as it is to transit. Those five big moves include an ambitious expansion of the county's rail network and more dedicated space for carpools, buses and bikes. The vision got mostly positive reactions from the mayors and city council members on the Sandag board. 
Many say decades-old promises of freeway widenings are incompatible with the need to fight climate change. Because you had an initial plan, and technologies change, and the future of mobility is constantly changing, it's always good to review what you've, what, what you've approved in the past to see, does that particular project make sense today for the future? There were dissenters, too, most of them North County conservatives. They're wary of shelving plans to widen the county's freeways and skeptical of research showing those widenings don't solve traffic congestion. Now, I want to make sure we have the integrity to move forward. I do agree with the vision. I think in the long term it's, it's worth it, but we got to make sure we keep the promises that we made. The big variable right now is the price tag. Sandag says it will have an estimate for how much its transportation plan will cost in a few months. Discussions will continue over the next two years, with a vote at the Board of Directors scheduled in late 2021. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Sandag recently delayed its timeline for the regional transportation plan, so it could come up with a proposal that aligns with the state climate goals. There was a time in California when it was easier for middle-class families to buy a home. Over the decades, those homes have appreciated, leaving many seniors able to continue to afford the good life. As part of our Graying California series, KPBS's Amitha Sharma has this profile. Today is the first day of spring, you know. Let's celebrate it with the fire. Carlos Luis Etorte piles logs in the fireplace as his wife Gerda Govine Etorte watches on with a big grin. Luis is a fire master. He has it down to a science. Luis is 75, Gerda is 77. They just moved to this three-bedroom Spanish-style home nestled in the hills of San Diego County. They have a pool, four and a half acres of land. It's like going back to the country, you know. It's as though this place was waiting for us all of our lives. Fate didn't finance the place, though. California real estate did. The couple bought their new home in Hamul for $610,000 after selling their Pasadena townhouse last fall for half a million. Without owning that townhouse in Pasadena, there was no way we could have bought this place. Gerda bought the townhouse for $99,000 in 1985 when homes were still affordable for middle-class California families. She's a retired educator and diversity consultant. Luis worked in cultural affairs at the city of Los Angeles. Today, they live off of retirement savings, social security, and a pension. It's our a, it's a survival. And they know they are fortunate to own and to have a pension, something fewer Californians can depend on. We have some benefits on the fact that we're older and we came through at a certain time. Benefits they recognize aren't spread evenly. Benefits that allow them to follow their creative passions. Luis and Gerda are artists. He's a sculptor and painter. He points to a painting in bright blues, pinks, and greens of geometric shapes. This piece is called the Las Siete Lunas Sin Fronteras, the seven moons without borders. And Gerda is a poet. I love when. He's in paint mode. She started writing after both her daughters died. She's working on her fifth book now. Red, orange, blue, yellow, purple, green. Stands close to canvas, almost cross-eyed. Takes step back, forward, sips coffee, stares intently. The couple see this new home as a place for their art to flourish. I'm planning to do my studio here. I have a lot of equipment. They also want other artists to find inspiration here. We can have poetry readings in here. Gerda envisions leading weekend retreats. Women 60 plus who are writers or poets, but they're shying away from it. I want them to come out here and experience the freedom, the air, to tap what's there. Looking out on their sprawling property on this overcast day, the couple put their arms around each other. And we're gonna take a chance. We're gonna go into this wide open space and see what happens. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. This story is part of our statewide California Dream collaboration. You'll find more stories at kpbs.org dream. 
Little Saigon is welcoming visitors this weekend to honor San Diego's Vietnamese American community. The event coincides with Black April, the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1975, marking the end of the Vietnam War. KPBS reporter Priya Shreeder shows us what we can expect. That's really good. Joseph Akong is a Vietnamese American who grew up in North County and remembers visiting Little Saigon in City Heights as a kid. Growing up, I didn't have a lot of Vietnamese community because my family lives very far away. And my parents uh, really wanted me to not struggle too much, to like speak, like struggle with English a lot. So they really didn't pushed me to try and be really involved with my culture. But as he got older, Hakong got more curious about his culture. After taking an ethnic studies class that focused on Vietnam in college, Hakong applied to join a photojournalism project that documented the experiences and everyday life of Vietnamese refugees in Little Saigon. It's part of Little Saigon Stories, a multimedia art project organized by two City Heights nonprofits. He says spending time in Little Saigon has made him think about his roots differently. I think it's also really important not to, not only to like be able to grow up and know English and know the culture, American culture here, but also be able to um, experience and relate to your own culture and keep the traditions that you feel like are meaningful from your country. Little Saigon Stories will be featured in a pop-up gallery in an empty storefront in the heart of Little Saigon. My name is Zhang Wei. I'm one of the core members of the community group called Big Boat. Also at the pop-up gallery, there will be a photo exhibition, an artist meet and greet, and film screening of short films featuring some of the business owners and leaders from Little Saigon. My name is Khan Lee. I am a general manager at Paris Bakery on Alcohol Boulevard. For me, it's a way to remember a route. Visitors to Little Saigon can also go on guided walking tours through the community and a self-guided food crawl throughout the day. We have a special place in our hearts for City Heights and this community. And we want to find different ways to lift this community up and to bring attention to this community. Hakong says he hopes that people across San Diego County can get to know how special his culture is. I think I just want them to know that it kind of exists. I feel like in the first place, a lot of people don't know that there is a little Saigon here. There is a history of Vietnamese people being relocated here and they've been continuing to have like their lives here. Priya Shreeder, KPBS News. The pop-up gallery is tomorrow from 4 to 8. You can find more details at kpbs.org. Babo Park's urban forest got a boost from a host of volunteers who planted new trees today. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson shows us how they celebrated Arbor Day. This was the second year in a row that volunteers and experts combined their energies to plant trees in the park. Balboa Park boasts the city's most robust urban forest. San Diego City Council member Jen Campbell says she wants to see that forest continue to thrive. Since Kate Sessions, the mother of Balboa Park, planted the first 100 trees in this park in the 1890s, San Diego has put an emphasis on adding trees to our canopy. We continue her legacy today by planting over 100 trees here in Balboa Park. The park's tree canopy is about 30 percent of the total area of the park. The rest of the city has a canopy of about 5 percent. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. If you have a camera or a smartphone and enjoy nature, the San Diego Natural History Museum wants your help. The NAT is encouraging people to take part in the City Nature Challenge. It's a contest to catalog wildlife. It kicked off today at 12 a.m. To take part, just download the iNaturalist app and head outside to capture wildlife, personal gardens, and pets don't count. The NAPS curator of herpetology says the San Diego region can win this global competition. My challenge is to post more than a thousand photos and there'll be a few of us that will post thousands of photos but there'll also be thousands of people that will just post a few photos and together those two halves make a great whole 
and um, we can win this competition. Last year, San Diego placed third for the number of species observed, participants, and observations. The contest wraps up Monday at 11.59 p.m. Well, it's Friday, so let's take a look at our weekend forecast with meteorologist Dodgy Swad. As we continue through this weekend and early next week, well, we're going to notice several things. Our high pressure begins to weaken and we'll be watching an upper level trough as well as a low move inland. That's going to mean more clouds as well as a chance for cooler conditions. And that will bring the chance for some spotty showers and thunderstorms out towards the mountains. When we mean spotty, very spotty. Partly cloudy skies tonight in San Diego with a low of 60. If you're out to Oceanside, still noticing the clouds as well with a low of 55 cooling down to 67 in Borrego Springs. It's clear as you head further inland. Some clouds trying to inch into Mount Laguna with a low of 49. Now as we talk about your Saturday staying cool at the coast, so temperatures not going to vary too much in the coastal areas. Warm conditions still in place here for the deserts and as you move further inland. But once again, as we move into your Sunday and Monday changes with your temperatures. So enjoy it out to Borrego Springs for tomorrow. High of 95. Be sure to stay hydrated. Put on the sunscreen. Topping off at 66 in Mount Laguna with some clouds mixing with sun. Mostly cloudy skies going to be likely out and towards Oceanside with a high of 69 in the upper 60s as well for San Diego. Looking at some clouds to come your way as well. This weekend it is warm and dry for much of the southwest. Wet weather going to be seen into the Midwest and continue to press its way further to the east. What we will notice once again is this upper level trough coming inland. That's going to bring a cooler batch of air in the Sacramento LA here in San Diego. Temperatures going to be about 10 to 15 degrees cooler, especially as we move into the desert areas, noticing that cool down isolated showers and thunderstorms. Uh, probably going to be looking at uh, 0.3 inches of rain out towards the mountains uh, and really not super impressive with that precipitation that will be coming our way for the coast. The next several days remaining in the upper 60s. What we'll notice is a shower Monday morning. That's gonna be our best chance for some uh, precipitation Tuesday. Low clouds remaining in place and the ending the return of some sunshine by the middle of the week. Temperatures cool down Monday inland areas topping off at in the upper 60s. We'll be looking at low clouds Tuesday and then Wednesday clearing deserts feeling that cool down no longer in the 90s by Monday only at a high of 77 and also noticing that cooler air out towards the mountains out of the 60s into the 50s for the early week with cloudy skies for Tuesday reporting for KPBS News. I'm Iraqi weather meteorologist Dodgy Aswad back to you. Avengers Endgame has finally arrived in theaters. KPBS film critic Beth Accomando has this spoiler-free review. It's been a long wait, but Avengers Endgame is here. This thing on? Hey, Miss Ponce. If you find this recording, don't feel bad about this. Part of the journey is the end. If you've been following the nearly two dozen films over the past 12 years, you won't be disappointed. But if this is your first Marvel film, you may wonder what all the fuss is about. Producer Kevin Fahey deserves high praise for masterminding the franchise and working diligently to make the Marvel film universe feel like a cohesive whole, despite the films varying widely in quality and tone. Endgame picks up where Infinity War left off, with half the living creatures turned to dust by Thanos' casual snap of his fingers. He used the stones again. Hey, we'd be going in short-handed, you know? Look, he's still got the stones, so... So let's get him. Use them to bring everyone back. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. Of course, it's not that simple. If we do this, how do we know it's going to end any differently than it did before? Because before, you didn't have me. Hey, new girl, everybody in this room is about that superhero life. And if you don't mind my asking, where the hell have you been all this time? There are a lot of other planets in the universe. And unfortunately, they didn't have you guys. The Russo brothers, who also directed Infinity War and a pair of Captain America films, wrap everything up with a proper mix of teary-eyed sentiment and good-natured humor. I have some minor complaints, most notably that I wish the characters of Thanos and Captain Marvel had been put to better use. But overall, the film delivers what it needs to. I like this one. With massive cross-cutting between multiple storylines, it feels like a brisk three-hour runtime. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. The 
Avengers Endgame is apparently a big deal. The Marvel movie officially opens today and forecasters expect it to dominate the box office. Whatever it takes. We'll talk about that, plus a whole lot more for the Friday Business Report. And joining us now is Miro Kopik with SDSU and Bottom Line Marketing. Hi, Miro. Hey, Ebony. So what's the big deal about this movie? There's a huge deal. Uh, it is a sequel of uh, the final installment of the, the 21 Avenger movies uh, and following last year's uh, Infinity Wars. Infinity Wars ended with a cliffhanger that was an epic cliffhanger. And so all types of moviegoers are interested in going to see Endgame. In fact, Endgame is projected to become the largest box office opening of any movie in North America and Canada, probably hitting north of 300 million. Infinity War had 250 million in opening, and it, what's interesting is all the 21 uh, movies from Marvel collectively have had 2.7 billion dollars of opening box office weekend revenues. So this movie is, is so impressive that Fandango, who's the leading online ticket sales for, for movies, is outselling tickets for Endgame five to one over Infinity War over the same time frame. Large movie chains like AMC, which is the largest movie chain in the United States, their stock price increased 10% alone on the news that ticket sales, pre-ticket sales, are going up substantially. And these movie theaters, because the movie is really long, three hours, um, they're dedicating up to 75% of their screens this weekend to Endgame, which means if you want to see a movie this weekend, it's going to be Endgame. In Miro, an embarrassing week of sorts for Samsung. The release of its new Galaxy Fold has been delayed after bad reviews. Could this possibly hurt the brand? Well, I think uh, it's, it will be hard for the brand to be hurt, uh, but Samsung has had some embarrassing failures. They've had phones that have exploded. The Fold, which is actually a very cool phone. It's an amazing new innovation in the, in the cell phone space. It's a combination cell phone and tablet. And, and, um, f and so for consumers, it's a big win. In fact, for, for Samsung, they innovate at a far faster rate than all their competitors. So this is when they announced the uh, Galaxy S10, they announced the Fold. People are very excited, but at a cost of $2,000 a unit, um, only early adopters would, would buy this. So that's why the, the brand damage would be limited. But what happened with the phone is that the early testers, when they used it, the phone stopped working after a couple of days. There was an interesting um, screen protector on the screen that's actually meant to stay on. They, a lot of people took it off, so consumers might take it off. That got debris in, in, in the display, and, and it made the display, um, you know, had issues with the display. Um, what this means in general for the phone business, because innovation has been sorely lacking. This was a big shot of good news uh, for the phone, for the cell phone industry. Uh, a lot of people have criticized Apple for the last couple of releases with really offering nothing new or criticizing them for adding features, removing, for example, the phone jack and, get, and making you buy expensive Bluetooth headphones. Yeah. So, so with that, this was a big thing for, for Samsung. So finally, a strong closings this week for the U.S. stock markets. What does that tell us? Well, this was a record week for uh, several of the indices. Uh, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ all hit record highs earlier in the week. The Dow almost reached its record high. And, and a lot of this is due to uh, this is kind of corporate earnings season. And, and what corporations did is in the in the fall when the stock market was dropping and they were concerned that the effects of the tax cut were not going to be pulling over into the first quarter, gave a lot of warnings about their earnings. Actually, the earnings this quarter have been extraordinarily strong. And in fact, the good news is that they're strong on operations, not on tax cuts or financial um, engineering. So this is really good for U.S. companies. Economists are still concerned because they're thinking about um, <clears throat> recession around the corner, uh, world, the world economy being uh, still struggling, countries like the Germany, the UK, Japan, China, and Brazil are all in, in, in kind of economic trouble. And so will the, this kind of the longest bull market in, in U.S. history continue uh, as of today? The answer could be yes. The U.S. reported a really robust 3.2 percent GDP growth. The markets ended the week very strong, and, um, and kind of we're going to wait and see. So that's all we have for the Friday Business Report. Mira Kopik, thank you so much. Thanks, Ebony. 
A fight over citizenship and the census goes to the Supreme Court. One local mayor wants a tougher plastic bag ban and how the experiences of seniors are shaping the California dream. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. Now for a recap of tonight's top stories. A recent nationwide outbreak of measles has the county on high alert. Local health officials are urging residents to vaccinate their children. So far this year, the CDC has confirmed nearly 700 measles cases across 22 states. The outbreak has not reached San Diego County. It's Arbor Day. Balboa Park's urban forest got a boost from a host of volunteers who planted new trees today. This was the second year in a row that volunteers and experts came together to plant trees in the park. If you have a camera or a smartphone and enjoy nature, the San Diego Natural History Museum is encouraging people to take part in the City Nature Challenge. It's a global contest to catalog wildlife that kicked off today. You can find out more information at kpbs.org. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.